Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation to come. I, I think it is, I thought it was against a Nimbin bylaw to start a talk on time, but given it's 4.20 and uh, we've got the 4.20 movement, um, uh, I think it's, it's perfectly fine to start this one talk in Nimbin on time at 4.20 about um, roadside drug tests and how it's really focused, I think. It, it's, it, it's a mock road safety program, the roadside drug testing program in New South Wales. It's a mock road safety program actually designed as a pretty nasty little culture war against cannabis. And I think you've been feeling it up here on the, on the North Coast for quite some time. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge we're here on the land of the Bunjong people, pay my respects to those elders past and present. And when we do that, um, I think we should actually commit to making this the year where we really start talking about getting a treaty with our first people. Acknowledging. <clears throat> Acknowledging this is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, they've never ceded sovereignty on it, and we owe them a treaty, decency and respects as the first people and amazing custodians of this wonderful continent. Uh, brings us to roadside drug tests. Uh, let me be clear about it to start with. If you are impaired by drugs, and you get behind the wheel of a, a motor vehicle, well then I think that's when the police should be intervening, you should be facing criminal penalties. And um, if you've endangered the lives of others, you should be losing your licence. But that's if you're impaired by drugs. But of course, the New South Wales roadside drug testing scheme isn't about impairment at all. It's actually about a nasty little culture war that Police Commissioner Scipione, in cahoots with the current police minister and Premier Baird in this state, are actually directing against cannabis and they're using road, roadside, uh, road safety as a smokescreen. And in fact, I'm pretty sure all of you would have seen that Nimbin's literally surrounded, as this talk is going ahead, Nimbin is surrounded by roadside drug testing units. Literally every road into Nimbin has a bunch of police, paid for by us and our taxes, out there to try and catch anybody who has the tiniest scintilla, the tiniest detectable amount of cannabis in their system want to throw the book at them, take their licence off them, take thousands of dollars off them, and I've got to say, all on the basis of some pretty, pretty flawed tests. So, where are we up to at the moment in New South Wales? Well, currently, the police are doing about 60,000 roadside drug tests a year. That's the saliva test. The saliva test is then followed, if it's positive, by a, a, a second test in the police, in the police vehicle. And then, if, then, then whether that's positive or negative, the whole thing goes off to a drug lab. So it's a three-step three process, but they're doing... That last year, they did a bit over 60,000 of those oral swabs. They plan to increase it to 97,000 a year by 2017. And what are they testing for? Well, they're testing for the mere presence, the slightest detectable presence of just three drugs. They're just testing for cannabis, ecstasy or MDMA and amphetamines. And so you can be zonked to the eyeballs on anything else and they'll wave you through, but if you've got a tiny little scintilla of any of those three drugs in your system, the smallest detectable amount, regardless of whether or not it's impairing your driving, bang, that's when they catch you. Um, how did we get here? Well, it all started in this state in 2006. It actually kicked off in Victoria a little bit earlier. And I heard um, Fiona Patton speaking earlier and sometimes you know, we look across um, uh, at what happens in Victoria and we think that they're a slightly more evolved political state than us in New South Wales, and in most parts that's right. But actual roadside drug testing program started in Victoria and then has spread like herpes around the rest of the, um, around the, rest of the country. And New South Wales caught the disease in 2006 and that's when they legislated the offence of, of anyone caught with the presence of cannabis, MDMA and ecstasy um, faces losing their licence. Uh, and, and it's a, when you come before a magistrate, after the police have said that you've got any of these drugs in your system, the magistrate's got no discretion. The magistrate has to take your licence off you. That, that, that's, that's largely right. The, 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 the magistrate, of course, the first time you appear before a magistrate, there's a chance you can get what's called a section 10 which is conviction proved, but they don't take your licence off you and they don't whack you with a fine. But if you're caught again within five years, no discretion, 
you lose your license, you cop a fine. And if you're caught the second time, you lose your license for up to 12 months. Um, so what are they testing for? Well, they're not testing for cocaine. Why are they not testing for cocaine? Um, well, cocaine we know from UK data is, and from international data, cocaine is one of the drugs that is, is, is quite prevalent. One of the two most commonly found drugs, um, illegal drugs, in, tra in crashes where the road trauma or the, in in or the injury was partly caused by drugs. So where we're seeing deaths or serious injury as a result of drug impaired driving, in the international data, cannabis is coming up as number two. Uh, cannabis is coming up as number one, and cocaine is coming up as number two in terms of illegal drugs. So why are we not testing for cocaine in New South Wales? Well, I asked the transport minister this in Parliament um, uh, just earlier this year. We said all the crash data says from around the world that cocaine is one of the principal drugs that is impairing drivers and leading to injury road trauma and death. Why don't we test for cocaine? And then the man, he's a remarkable man, he's called Duncan Gay, he's a National Party MP. He looked a bit confused and he sat down and, and then he asked, got, so he got his staff to give him some notes and about half an hour later he came back and he said, I'm gonna answer that question that you asked, Shoebridge, you know, you drug peddler. Um, I'm gonna answer that question. And he said, the reason we don't test in New South Wales for cocaine is because he's been told by the Centre for Road Safety, that you can only detect cocaine in people's saliva for up to six minutes after they consume it. <laughs> and I think everybody in the parliament, well, at least everybody who, who um, was conscious in the parliament, looked at him and blinked. And um, when I asked him the next day, I said, you're not serious, are you? I mean, you're not actually serious that you think you can only detect cocaine for up to six minutes after people consume it. And um, he just ranted and went off on a, a little, um, peculiar little rant at me. Um, but that kind of nonsense, I mean, that palpably stupid approach, I mean, we know, in fact, that, that, that cocaine can be detected in people's saliva for up to 24 hours after they consume it. Um, it's often not detectable after six hours, six hours, not six minutes, but it can be detected for up to 24 hours. But we've got the road transport minister, the guy responsible for funding roadside drug testing, running around in some sort of bizarre alternative universe where he thinks the reason they're not testing for cocaine is because police can't pick it up more than six minutes after they use it. Um, well, I think you might be onto something there. So we had a little look at cocaine and when you look at the national data that's crunched about every three years by the federal agency that looks at illicit drug taking across the country, Cocaine is overwhelmingly a wealthy person's drug. Uh, it is overwhelmingly used by the top 20% um, SES bracket, you know, the people in the top 20% income bracket. They're the ones who use cocaine, overwhelmingly, because it's an expensive drug. And because it's been used by the elite, the elite influence our lawmakers to make sure that, that they don't test for cocaine even though we know that if you wanted to have a sensible road safety uh, program testing for drugs, you'd have cocaine at the top of your list. And, and of course, cannabis, unlike cocaine, is pretty much used right across society. It's not necessarily a poor person's drug, it's definitely not a wealthy person's drug, it's just used across society more broadly. And, and, and the police are actually targeting their testing, and you know this, they're targeting their roadside drug testing in communities where they want to break what they see as a cannabis culture, where they want to break alternative cultures, where they really want to impose themselves uh, on a community. And that's why Nimbin today is surrounded by roadside drug testing that's not looking at cocaine, but is actually really focused on cannabis. Um, there's another drug they're not testing for, which is benzodiazepines, you know, Valium and the like. Um, uh, Again, when you look at the, road, at, the, at the road trauma statistics from around the world, benzodiazepine is actually right up there after alcohol as the drug that's actually, as the class of drugs that is actually impairing drivers. Um, and they're prescription drugs, of course. You know, they're not illegal drugs. They're prescription drugs. But, well, the, you know, they, they, they fit into their moral definition of good drugs, absolutely. But these morally defined good drugs are seriously impairing drivers. 
I mean, uh, a very large dose of benzodiazepine greatly impairs your reaction time, um, uh, seriously impairs your judgment calls for when you're driving. And we know, again, from international data, it's, it's right up there in terms of the drugs that are impairing drivers and causing road trauma and death. But we're not testing for benzodiazepines in New South Wales, not at all. Again, why are we not testing for benzos? Well, because it's overwhelmingly considered to be a middle-class drug. And if they started taking people's license off them because they had a trace element of benzodiazepine, well, there would be a revolution on the northern suburbs of Sydney. And if we did it with cocaine, the whole eastern suburbs and the northern suburbs would rise up in revolt and surround the parliament, you know. We'd have merchant bankers coming out at their first ever, um, at their first ever uh, rally, rally for drug law reform. Um, <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, I have, he's my local member, yeah, that Wentworth would fall. Um, so we were first, my office was first asked to look into this roadside drug testing thing about, uh, it's coming on for two years ago now, and, and, and some of those requests came from the Hemp Embassy here, and I give, I give Michael and the Hemp Embassy real credit for actually putting this on the radar, and I really do. <clears throat> and they said, look, David, you know, this is terrible, this roadside drug testing thing. Um, they're, they're just knocking people out who'd, who'd had a joint a week ago or a fortnight ago, you, you should do something about it. And I thought, oh, Michael, you know, can't be that bad. Um, but I said, I'll look into it. And so we put a series of um, GIPA requests in, these freedom of information requests to the New South Wales Police. And we wanted to know what the basis of their testing was. And one of the things we wanted to know was what the police standard operating procedures are. These are the, kind of like the, the, the guidebook for police about how they go about doing drug operations. And they have one for drug dogs. And that's a whole other separate topic, the stupidity of drug dogs. And I, we've got Tom here from our Sniff Off um, campaign. Hey, Tom. Um, and um, I'd urge anyone, you know, to, if, if, if they haven't already had a look at our Sniff Off website that's identifying where drug dog operations are happening, the stupidity of drug dogs, the fact that they're getting it wrong 75% of the time, the fact that on Sydney's trains, for example, they're getting it wrong 80% of the time, have a look at the Sniff Off Facebook page and you can see stupidity. But there's a set of drug dog, there's a set of standard operating procedures for how they use drug dogs. And they basically say you have 10 police for every drug dog. Um, and there's another set of standard operating procedures for how they do ro ro random breath tests for alcohol. And they've got another set of standard opera operating procedures for how they do roadside drug testing, which is the oral swab and then the Draeger and the like. And so we thought that would be really interesting. And I don't know if you can read it here, but right up at the front of, this, of, of the, the New South Wales Police standard operating procedures on roadside drug testing, you can see that yellow highlighted thing there, it says this, the program, and then this is the police doing it themselves, in bold and capital, does not infer impaired driving or driving a motor, motor vehicle under the influence of a drug. The program detects the presence, in capitals and bolds, of an illicit drug in a subject's oral fluid. They're not embarrassed about it. They whack it in their own standard operating procedures. This isn't about getting impaired drivers off the road. The police are telling us that. It's about their moral crusading agenda against cannabis. Um, so what, what, what are the three steps? The first step is the roadside saliva test. That's the oral swab. Um, that, as I said, detects just cannabis or THC, amphetamines and MDMA. And if you fail that test, if it turns the wrong colour after, you, after the police put it in your mouth, they'll take you out of your car if they've got a van next door or a police, or a police vehicle, they'll, get, they'll run the test, another oral swab, through this Draeger 500 or 5000 machine. Now, that little Draeger unit can test for cocaine. It can test for heroin. It can test for ketamine. It can test for benzodiazepines. But the New South Wales Police have turned all those features off. Turn them off. Why? Well, that brings us back to our earlier discussion. They've got the machine that can test for cocaine and they choose not to use it. They've got it to test for benzodiazepines and they choose not to use it. Let's be clear about it. It's not a road safety campaign. They've just turned on the cannabis button and that's really all they really want to test for. MDMA and amphetamines if they can get it. Whether or not you pass or fail that second test, the police then send it off to a lab to get a final definitive um, test, uh, answer about your drug testing. 
And for you, if you're a driver and you're caught up in this, this, this police machinery, if you fail the first test, you, that's when you get dragged out and you get the second test. If you fail the second test, the Drager unit, well, then you lose your licence straight away for 24 hours. Um, you can't drive your vehicle. And then you can drive again after 24 hours, subject to what happens with the lab test. And if lab test comes in negative, bang, you lose your licence again. If you pass the second test, so if you fail the first oral test and you pass the second test, well, you can drive away, but they still send it off to the lab to test for an even lower level and lower concentration levels, and you could still lo lose your licence a couple of months later when the police get around to telling you about it. What do they test for? Well, it's not entirely clear. We asked the New South Wales Police what levels they're testing for, for THC, MDMA and for um, amphetamines, and they said they didn't know. That was actually their answer. We don't know. We don't keep the records. We just send it off to the lab, and the lab comes back positive or negative. That, that's actually the, the state of play for the New South Wales Police. They don't even know what levels they're testing for. We've had a look at the Australian standards, which we assume is what the lab is testing for, but of course we haven't got the answers back from the lab yet. And that shows that they're testing for extremely low levels, tiny trace elements of THC, tiny trace elements of amphetamines. Um, uh, and of course it's about concentrations in your saliva. Um, and that's why we're seeing people lose their licence because they had a joint a week before they got behind the wheel of a vehicle. It's why we're seeing people lose their licence, because they had a joint three or four days before they got behind the wheel of the vehicle. It's why Joseph Carroll, when he got pulled over by police twice last year, finally got sick of it. Because Joseph Carroll was pulled over earlier last year by the police and he tested positive. And he thought that was pretty crap because he hadn't had a joint for like a number of days. And he said to the police, hang on. I thought you guys were telling us that it was 24 hours. You had to wait 24 hours between having a joint and getting behind the wheel of a vehicle. I've waited a couple of days. How am I testing positive? Doesn't make sense to me. And in fact, the Centre for Roadside Safety in New South Wales and the Transport Minister in New South Wales for the last couple of years have been saying it's a 24-hour window. You've got to wait 24 hours after consuming cannabis before you can safely get behind the wheel of a vehicle. Poor old Joseph waited a series of days. But the police said, oh, look, no, sorry, mate, um, uh, they're pretty sensitive, these machines. You've got to wait at least a week. And he went, OK. And he'd failed the test, and he thought, OK, he, he, he was getting ground through the machinery. Um, he had his 24 hours off the road. He got back on behind the wheel of a vehicle. Um, he was waiting for the, second lab, for, the third, for, the, for the lab test to come in, waiting to see what would happen to him. And while he was waiting for that process to happen, he got pulled over again by the police. This time, he'd waited eight or nine days between smoking a joint and getting behind the wheel of a vehicle. Gets pulled over again. And just stopping Joseph's story there for a minute, the reason Joseph got pulled over again is because once you fail one of these tests, or once somebody who's driving your vehicle fails one of these tests, the police feed your registration into their database, and then all police patrol cars are constantly monitoring everyone's number plates. And if your number plate comes up as they're driving past you, that's when you get the woo, and they pull you over and they test you again. And there are people who have been tested six, six and seven times because they've failed once and they're constantly being pulled over by police. Anyhow, so Joseph was in that category. Woo, he got pulled over again. And he thought, that's okay, eight or nine days. Bang, he tests positive again. And he says, this can't be right. He says to the police officer, the last time I got pulled over by a police officer, he told me I had to wait seven days. I've waited eight or nine days. Seriously. I had to join eight or nine days ago. What are you doing? And they said, sorry, mate, this is what the testing you know. And They processed him, he failed the second test, bang, went off and failed the lab test. He comes before the magistrate. Um, magistrate uh, down there at Lismore. There's a couple of magistrates down there who have been dealing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these cases. Hundreds. You can't get a contested domestic violence order proceeding to run in the Lismore Magistrates Court because they're too busy dealing with roadside drug tests. It's seriously that bad. Um, and the magistrate found Joseph not guilty because the magistrate said, well, what more can you expect of a citizen? The uh, this bloke had made an honest and reasonable mistake of fact. He'd actually spoken to the police 
and asked them about what he needed to do in order to ensure that he was safe and not breaching the road rules. And the police had told him, you've got to wait seven days. He'd waited eight or nine days, reliant upon the advice he'd gotten from the authorities and the police. And based upon that reasonable mistake of fact, he didn't have, could not have any criminal intent to break the law and indeed found him not guilty. Bang, charges thrown out. As soon as that happened, a whole bunch of people have now started challenging the roadside drugs test. They've all gone on and had a look at the information provided by that genius who is Duncan Gay, the Minister for, Trans the Minister for Transport in New South Wales. They've had a look at what he had to say, and he normally says, you've got to wait 24 hours, except for cocaine, we're at six minutes. Um, they've had a look at what the roadside, the Road Safety Centre, the Centre for Road Safety are saying, and in fact, after this judgement, the Centre for Road Safety have slightly changed the wording on their, on their warning on their website. They now say, typically, it takes just 24 hours for it, for, for it to be out of your system and not detectable. Whereas before they'd made the positive assertion it was 24 hours, they now say, typically, 24 hours. But a number of people have been relying upon the advice being provided by the Centre for Road Safety, which is typically 24 hours, or the public statements made by the Minister for Transport, where he's saying 24 hours is all you have to wait. And therefore, when they've been caught three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10 or 14 days after they've smoked a joint, they're going down to the local court and saying, I made a reasonable and genuine mistake of fact. I thought I was safe. I can't believe I've been pulled over. And um, to see how that was operating in practice, myself and one of my staff members actually went to the Lismore local court earlier this year. And we sat in the back of the court on a Tuesday, the first Tuesday of the month, when they actually have most of these drug driving, drug driving charges called over. And case after case after case, we had individuals standing up and saying, three days, I hadn't smoked a joint for three days, or 24 hours, or a week. And you know what? The police did not contest their evidence in a single case, not in a single case. And in every case, where these people weren't actually taking the Carroll defence or the reasonable and genuine mistake of fact, the magistrate was had to say, well, look, I accept what you say. I accept you had no intent. I accept on all the evidence you weren't impaired. But if this is your second offence, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take your licence off you, whack you with a couple of hundred dollars fine, and you better not do it again. And some people were coming back for the second time because they'd been the subject of, you know, that licence, um, ongoing online licence searching by the, by the police. And he just said, I've got no discretion. If you have two of these offences within five years, the second time around, I can't give you a section 10. I'm taking your licence off you for 12 months. And I saw people in that court who said, one bloke had had a terrible liver complaint, um, receiving ongoing treatment. He lived a bit out of town and he needed his licence to get in and get his medical treatment. And he says, I, I won't be able to get to town to get my medical treatment. Sometimes I have an emergency. I've just got to get in there straight away. And the magistrate just said, I can't do anything about it. It's totally unfair. I accept it's totally unfair, but the law says I've got to take your licence off you. It's the second time. I've, I've had reported to me that particularly in some Aboriginal communities where a number of people have lost their licence for, um, for not being able to pay fines or had their licence taken off them because they haven't paid a parking fine. Some of them have lost their licence because they've been involved in drink driving. There's often only a few people in a community that have got, got, got a licence. And those people are now losing their licence because of the RDT program. And there are Aboriginal communities that are getting pretty much fundamentally isolated as a result of the RDT program that's been run out. And the New South Wales government just doesn't care. The police minister doesn't care. I don't even think he's aware of it. They've just got this ideological bent that they're going on. Um, it's a downright crime. It's a travesty. And it's happening all around uh, Nimbin as we speak. So um, we've been plugging away trying to get some further data and we just got some data um, this week. It's so hot off the press that when I was typing up the PowerPoint presentation last night, I did that. Um, sorry about that. Um, it's a dramatic increase in the number of roadside tests. But we wanted to know, hot off the press, we wanted to know, I was looking through the data, which we literally got this week. We've got the number of tests that they've done year after year from when they started rolling, expanding the program in 2012. We wanted to know how many tests they've done, how many ended up being negative, how many ended up being positive in the first and the second tests and the third tests. And um, this, is, this shows you the data. 
So the green line on the left is the number of tests that they did in 2012. Then the next one to it is the number of tests they did in 2013. The next is the number in 2014, and the next is the number in 2015. You can see it's skyrocketed well over 60,000. The next column, the, 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 the second column along, initial positives, that's the number of initial positives that you get with the roadside swabs. And you can see that the, the initial positives are now ticking up to almost 10,000. Um, the next one is the negatives, and the two columns after that are the positives and negatives that come out after the second test. That probably doesn't show you much, just looking at the data there, but the next one is kind of illustrative. What this shows is the proportion of positive tests that are coming out of the first swab, the oral swab, and then the Draeger 5,000 5, unit, the Draeger 500 unit. So what it shows is that when they started rolling, expanding the program in 2012, and they really got excited by it, that they were getting a positive, about 2% of their tests were positive, the swab tests were positive. So two out of 50, uh, two out of 100, one out of 50 were being positive in 2012. 2013, roughly the same, they were getting two or 3%. Now it seems that about this point, the police were thinking, why do we go to this bother? We're getting such small rates. Then if you notice, when we get into 2014, the, the positive rate starts to rise. And then by the time you get to 2016, the top graph there, the, the green one, shows that they're getting a 16% positive rate from the initial oral swab. So they've gone from having 2% positive in 2012 to a 16% positive rate in 2016. And the second graph shows the Draeger 5000 unit, shows that they've gone from having just on 2% in, 20, in 2012 up to about 11, almost 11% positive rate, this huge surge in positive rates. Now, this massive increase in positive rates has happened at the same time as they've had this massive expansion in the drug testing regime. Well, how has that come about? Do we really think that there are eight times as many drug drivers, people with drugs in their system in 2016 as it was in 2012? No, that's nonsense. Can it be explained by some sort of criminal, uh, some sort of new policing genius in, on the part of the New South Wales Police where they're eight times more effective in who they're targeting for roadside drug testing? Well, I doubt it. Probably a little bit of it. A little bit of it might be explained by their licence scanning, this constant scanning of our licences. So that a little bit of it might be explained by that, but there would only be a small amount. We have a whole lot of other material that we ask the police to provide us in our most recent freedom of information request, and we're fighting with them on that. We're probably taking them to court on that. But one of the things we wanted the police to tell us was, what's the basis of your testing? What's the threshold you're testing for? What are the units that you use testing for? And our analysis of this data, our initial analysis of this data, remember we only got it this week, says this that the police weren't happy with their positive rates in 2012, 2013 and, and, and 2014. And they've changed what they're testing for. They've got more sensitive tests, they've lowered the threshold, they're widening the net, and they're massively expanding the number of people they're gonna be failing under, the road, under, the, under their um, roadside drug testing. They're setting the threshold lower and lower and lower to catch more and more people who are seven or 14 or 28 days after they've had a joint and it's a bloody disgrace. <clears throat> it is, it's a bloody disgrace. So how should the law work? Well, it's not hard. It's actually not hard. We should all be on the same page here about roadside drug safety. If you're impaired by drugs, police should be testing for you and stopping you from driving, and, and, and that's what our law should be doing. So we should be testing for impairment, not for present. and we should be test not for mere presence. And we should be testing for all the drugs, the commonly impaired driving, legal or legal, Legal or illegal. I don't care if somebody's, impair, if, if somebody's impairment comes about as a result of a, a, a legal or an illegal drug. If they're impaired from drug taking, if they're zonked to their eyeballs on benzodiazepines or zonked to their eyeballs on speed, I don't want to be sharing the road with them. And that's what the roadside drug testing should be aimed at. Not just three illegal drugs that happen to fit the little prejudice of the coalition government that we have in New South Wales at the moment. And... and, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
we can follow what they're doing in the United Kingdom. Because the United Kingdom had this debate. They had the discussion. They, they, they put in place a fact-finding mission and a panel called the Wolf, Wolf Report and the Wolf Commission into drug driving. And as a result of that, the UK law now actually looks at eight legal and illegal drugs and it sets an impairment level. They've looked at the road data and they've said that once you've got a certain blood concentration of cannabis or cocaine or benzodiazepines in your system, then you're a menace. And, and if, we're found, if you're found with that level of drugs in your system, then you will be, you will, you will be guilty of an offence and you can lose your licence. And they're even a little bit more sophisticated than that. They realise, unlike the New South Wales government, that drugs is kind of complicated. And that if you're taking cocaine and alcohol together, it increases your impairment level. And so the impairment thresholds for both drop. And if you're taking cannabis and alcohol together, well then, of course, the, the safe level of alcohol and cannabis in your system drops from 0.05 to 0.02 for alcohol and similarly for cannabis. They get it. They look at the evidence. And they've got a drug driving program that has got broad social acceptance. So we've got a pretty simple call. Stop the evidence-free roadside drug testing regime being done by the New South Wales Police. Simple call. And I can tell you that what is now, I think what the Baird government, what Troy Grant, the police minister, what Andrew Scipioni, that deeply intolerant police commissioner, think is currently a marginal issue, is going to become a mainstream issue because the police are massively expanding their roadside drug testing regime across the state. They're going to have 97,000 of these, almost 100,000 of these a year. And we're going to see more and more people from across society being roped in to this stupid scheme and losing their licence, paying thousands of dollars in, in fines on the basis of a grossly flawed uh, drug testing regime. And we're going to join with those people. We're going to build a movement. We're going to fix the law. And that's our commitment to you. Thanks very much. Okay, we have any questions? Yes. Okay, let us walk to you. Okay. Come to this lady first. Are we on? Yeah. Hi, David. That was really fantastic. Thank you very much. Can you wave? I can't, okay. <laughs> As my fear is that I know I'm going to um, take some drugs tonight, but I've got to leave for work at six o'clock tomorrow morning from here to drive to work, so I'm most interested in this. Um, I'm wondering if the help and case ruling has set a precedent for either New South Wales or Australia? Yeah. Well, the help and case was based on some pretty standard law that's been around for a couple hundred years, actually. That's a pretty... Um, if, if, if you as a citizen make an honest and reasonable and genuine mistake, you generally won't be found legally um, culpable for your actions. Uh, an example would be if you, went to a, if you went to a bar and you ordered a soft drink, but instead of getting a soft drink, they gave you a vodka and coke or something, and you'd consumed it and then gone out and driven, and you'd been found to, to, to blow the, the alcohol limit because you're maybe a P plate driver and you had a zero alcohol limit, and you could prove that, well, then you would be found not guilty of an offence under the RBT. And in fact, Helpen just applied that existing state of law and he applied it to this case. And, and actually, good news, the Northern Star is just reporting today, in fact, that the police had originally said that they were appealing the Helpen decision, trying to overturn it, take it to the Supreme Court and overturn it. And they'd put a notice of intention to appeal it in. And they were trying to sort of kill this particular line of um, defence for people. But they've just, the Northern Star is actually just reporting today that the police have withdrawn the appeal and they realise they can't win on their appeal. So the defence still lies. So I'd, that's good news, that's good news. Um, it's not because the police suddenly thought they would do the right thing, it's because they realised they had a legally indefensible case. And uh, let's be clear about it. Um, but, the, um, uh, but I'd urge you all to go and have a look at the advice that's been given by the Centre for Road Safety, Google you know, Duncan gay stupid comments and see what they have to say about roadside drug testing and rely upon the advice you get from those authority figures because they tend, they tend to be saying typically 24 hours or 24 hours or less. And uh, I've got to say, if you think it's bad in New South Wales, the Northern Territory, just at the end of last year, brought in their own version of roadside drug testing using the same dumb laws 
and they're proposing to put people in jail for up to six months for breaching it in the Northern Territory. And of course, who's going to be going to jail in the Northern Territory, you ask? Well, overwhelming the Aboriginal people and, and, and Torres Strait Islander people. Yep. Thank you very much for standing up for this. It's so corrupt and biased and wrong. So I think it's time that we uh, revealed a way around it and we've tested and we know for a fact that uh, a herbal extract called anise myrtle or aniseed myrtle, you swill it around your mouth and it masks that drug tests and also there's a um, pharmaceutical product you buy in the chemist for eight bucks. I carry it with me all the time and that's biotine and I think we should keep it fairly quiet and if there's any undercovers in here, too bad because they're not going to ban these herbs and they're, and they're not going to ban a pharmaceutical product. So yeah. that's anise, yeah. myrtle and, and biotine. Fight back. Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if they're effective or not. Um, I don't have any basis um, to, to, to make that sort of judgment call. Uh, my focus is on actually trying to have a rational test in the first place. Question here. Yep. Um, you said that they're not releasing the information on what the threshold is. I mean, we know it's 60 kilometres per hour or we know it's 0.05. <coughs> How can it stand up in court if we don't even know what we're not supposed mm. to do? It's a bit like Donald Rumsfeld um, offence, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, well, this is an unknown unknown in terms of what the level is. The law says the mere presence. The police then get the rely upon the lab report and the lab report comes back and says they have tested it. Um, there's some provisions in the Evidence Act that basically allows them to just tender the lab report. Yeah. And once they tender the lab report, it says there's the presence of drugs in your system, you're basically slotted. We did have one bloke who was in Queanbeyan last year um, who was a tradie. And in fact, tradies, anyone in a ute is also being targeted by the police with roadside drug testing. And um, he says that him and his mates basically avoid the main roads now because if they're driving in a ute, they're constantly being pulled over by the police and tested for roadside drug testing. Um, but he got pulled over um, early last year and failed the swab test. They took him in and he failed the second test. He fa No, they took him in and he passed the second test in the police van. And the police got very agitated. And they tested him again. And then he failed the next test. And he says, is that normal? Do you normally test a guy twice? He said, because I don't take drugs. I've never taken drugs. And um, they said, oh, well, it's not usual, mate, but we'll send it off to the lab and you can't drive for 24 hours. He needs his vehicle for work. He said he'd never taken drugs. The police didn't care. They took his licence off him for 24 hours went off to a lab result, the lab result came back and he tested positive. And he thought, this is crap, because he never takes drugs. So he went and saw his lawyer, and he said to his lawyer, this is crap, I never take drugs. And he was there with his wife, and the lawyers do what lawyers do, and they said, okay, I hear what you say. Says to the wife, would you mind stepping outside for a second? She steps outside, and they say to him, look, mate, everybody says this. Everybody says this. They never take drugs. Your wife's not here. Do you really want to spend thousands of dollars challenging this? Because, you know, most of the time we get these instructions, ends up someone's taken drugs. He says, seriously, I've never taken drugs in my life, never. And they say, OK, all right. So they ask for another test to be done by the lab. And you can ask for that. You can request a retest by the lab. And the lab test came back this time negative. And they said, well, okay, withdraw the charges. And the police said, no, 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 mate, we're not withdrawing the charges, we're gonna have it tested again. And it went back to the lab and they had it tested a third time, and the third time it also came back negative. And it was only at that point that they withdrew the charges, but not before this poor bloke had been out of pocket about five or $6,000 to defend the case and get his lawyers to do it. And we've asked for the police to make an ex gratia payment for his legal costs, but today we've had not even the courtesy of a response. So the lab test is faulty, they said when we raised that with them that they had a handling error that they've now fixed. Well, who knows? Who knows? All right. Hello. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that there is a pharmaceutical medication called pantoprazole, which gives a false U yeah. um, THC reading in urine. So that's actually mm. posted on the internet. That's mm. actually also... Um, uh, posted in medical journals. So if anyone's taking that medication um, in urine, when they do test your urine, it will come up as a positive for THC. Well, at the moment they're testing, it's all saliva-based testing, um, but we have had a number of anecdotal reports that in fact 
the um, Ritalin can lead to a false positive um, under the oral testing as well. Um, and in fact, the initial oral tests, you can see, if we just go back, you can see from the discrepancy between those two, two graphs, the top one is the initial oral swab test and the second one under it is the Draga 500, the more sophisticated test. You can see that we're already, we're already getting a pretty high false positive test in that initial, um, in that initial roadside drug test that they're doing. Um, of course, the police don't proactively publish this data. You have to squeeze it out of them. Um, and as I said, there's a bunch of other stuff we asked them for that they haven't given us. Um, we're having an ongoing debate with them at the moment, but we'll, we'll probably end up in court forcing them to give us the data and tell us how and why they're using this program. A little, a little tangential here, but um, I do recall the police have opposed the drug... Um, the food reform laws for hemp seed multiple times because of the chances of false positives interfering with their drug driving laws. Do you have you FOI'd the police to see if there's a, any scientific basis for their claims? Um, in terms of scientific basis, that hemp seed products might actually lead to a false positive in the saliva, um, we actually have asked the police for any of the studies that they have about their programs, any of their, um, we've asked the Justice Department to provide any evidence they have about the effectiveness and the, and the rationale behind this. They, they say they have nothing. They have no documents, they have no reports, they have nothing. So it, this really is evidence-free territory. They've just picked up what happened in Victoria. They thought that looks good on a press release and they've just replicated it across New South Wales and they don't really care about the impacts. But I suppose that gets to the point why are they doing it? If it's not about road safety, why are they doing it? Well, my sense of the matter is that we've got a deeply, deeply conservative hierarchy there. Andrew Scipioni is a deeply conservative right-wing reactionary when it comes to drug law reform, and he's our police commissioner. We've got Troy Grant, who's the police minister, who's in the same category, and we've got Mike Baird, who's a deeply reactionary right-wing conservative when it comes to any drug law reform tinkers around on the very margins, as Maureen said, on, on medicinal cannabis, but otherwise is deeply against moving anywhere on drug law reform. And I think they can feel that the movement is, is growing to legalise cannabis. And I reckon that they're thinking this is their fallback. If they lose the big argument on legalising cannabis, they want to make sure that they've got another nasty little legal regime under it, which they can still whack cannabis users on, and still exert police power over the cannabis community. And I'm pretty sure that's what it is. It's their fallback solution. And, and that, it's also why they're dead against hemp seed products. And indeed, you're right, a number of police around the country have actually made submission on submissions when the food regulators have been looking at legalising hemp products and saying, oh, you can't legalise hemp products because it might screw around with our roadside drug testing program. Yeah, there's, there's, no good ev there's, no, there's no particularly coherent body of evidence that says the ingestion of hemp seeds will end up giving you positive tests in your saliva. Um, but nevertheless, that's the basis upon which police have made those submissions. So that really is the tail wagging the dog, isn't it? You can't have a healthy, uh, positive food product because it might have a marginal impact on a particularly stupid roadside drug testing program by the police. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> I just... Um, wanted to mention, like everybody, like not everybody is a smoker. A lot of people sort of tend to take it for medicine purposes too, ingesting it, etc. I've got it in my toothpaste. Yeah. Um, you know, I smoke a bit at night to help me mm. sleep. But if you just ingest it, is that still going to come up as a as a positive to these bunch of Freemasons? Um, long and the short of it is, it, 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 there's a good chance of it. Uh, and in fact, I told you I was sitting down there in the Lismore Court, and it was like a little, little lesson in the, the extent to which cannabis is being used by people um, as part of their medical treatment and to deal with pain. And there were a number of people who came in before the magistrate and said, um, one of them had, had chronic leg pain, a series of knee operations, which hadn't gone particularly well, had been in deep, deep pain, um, and had been on a heavy pharmaceutical load to try and deal with the pain, which he found it just zonked him out and turned him into a bit of a zombie. And he slowly got himself off that, that heavy pharmaceutical load, but he would take tincture of cannabis in order to deal with the pain so he'd get a good sleep at night. Now, surely, in any rational world, that would be a great thing. 
Someone's going off a suite of expensive pharmaceuticals, causing them all sorts of negative side effects, replacing it with a tincture of cannabis, which they take at night, they get a good sleep. And in fact, he got, his, he got a job. He was working as a delivery, um, doing deliveries. He needed his licence. And um, he said that cannabis was helping him deal with the pain and it got his life back in, in, on track, in fact. Magistrate said, I hear what you say. It's a terrible story. Second time you're before me. Goodbye licence. You can't drive. Lose your job. Um, and what do you say to that? I mean, the obvious answer is change the law, it's nuts. But yeah, that's, that's exactly what's happening on a routine basis in our courts. Um, what was I going to say? I think the biggest mistake that governments make is to classify marijuana together with other hmm. heavy drugs. And Queensland is just about to reclassify marijuana from a Schedule 2 up to a Schedule 1 again. Um, and I'm just wondering, we're so close to the Queensland border, I'm wondering if, if you could talk about the roadside drug testing in Queensland and uh, whether or not they're as crazy as New South Wales. Same dumb laws, probably an even more right-wing government, but I don't know the extent to which they're doing tests at the moment. My, my sense is that... Well, I don't know the extent to which they're doing tests, but I know the law is the same, the test is the same, the mere presence... I assume they're doing something as or equally or perhaps even potentially more stupid than New South Wales. You know, New South Wales, you look down to Victoria and you think there might be some hope for the world. You look north to Queensland and... Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, basically the same test is now applied across the entire country, the mere presence of. Hmm. Uh, just as to why they are doing it and possibly a judgment on the actual intellect of the people who are doing it, is it possible that the legalisation of cannabis is an inevitability and that squeezing as much energy out of a change process and as much kind of raw data information in the court system whilst at the same time uh, penetrating a sort of larger audience of people and making them kind of come into the awareness of the effects of cannabis in the larger society? Because, I mean, if you think about it, every person that gets busted and they talk to their friends yeah. and blah, blah, blah. You get a 10, you get 100 people out of one person who has to make the, the energy sacrifice, as, you, might, as you, you, you could see what I'm saying. So rather than us feeling like uh, the victims of these dark, as you say, Masonic overlords, um, maybe it is that we are the benefactors of an inevitability and a system that is designed to produce that effect. Yeah. Um, maybe you know about that sort of thing or something. Well, you do find that sometimes, you know, the, the organisations that are there to protect uh, the status quo, when the status quo is looking deeply, um, deeply undermined, that's when they become the most repressive, that's when they start looking for additional ways to try and, and enforce their will on an unwilling majority. And well, I think we're there, I think you're probably right, we're probably there when it comes to cannabis law reform. They're feeling much more fragile. They're feeling much more vulnerable. They're feeling like the community is moving against them and we're going down an almost inevitable international path to legalise cannabis. So this is kind of the empire striking back um, and those last sort of angry, dying moments of the empire striking back. But it's causing untold misery around New South Wales, in fact, around the country, as they're striking back and, and being willing to ruin perfectly innocent lives, people who have been no threat to anybody on the roads, ruin their lives in the course of their, um, their crusade against cannabis. Yeah, but see, as they expand this program, they're going to reach into more and more households. And as you make it clear, everybody who's caught in this loses their licence on a particularly dumb test. They talk to 10 of their friends, they, they talk to their family, the message gets out. And, and, and rather bizarrely for the... For, for, for the for the police and the current government, it actually helps build the campaign to tear down these, these stupid laws. But between now and then, we're going to have a lot of grossly unnecessary pain. Hi, David. Uh, I've talked about this before, but yep. Australia being the only country in the Western world without a Bill of Rights, and after listening to Dana today from Canada, their Bill of Rights actually does help in the yeah. courts, etc for lenient, more lenient sentences and looking at things like the breathalyzer, mm. throwing things out. When is Australia... And I know the Greens in New South Wales have got an amended Bill of Rights since 2011. Are we moving any closer 
to getting one. So at least we've got a Bill of Rights to use. Yeah. Well, we just kicked off this week a, a, a new group called Greens Lawyers um, in New South Wales. They just kicked off on Wednesday night. And top of our agenda, the Greens Lawyers agenda, is actually making the argument for a Bill of Rights. Because every time, every time we see this, another injustice where we've got dumb laws producing grossly unjust outcomes, as a lawyer, you have to tell people, well, they can do this. The New South Wales Parliament can do this because there's nothing that stops them. They can basically make any dumb law, override any of your common law rights or your traditional rights or your basic liberties, and there's nothing really that actually stops them. There is, there are some, there is a Bill of Rights in Victoria which actually provides some kind of constraint. And in fact, we just got taught a lesson on human rights law by Papua New Guinea. Um, um, you know, uh, They've got a better human rights framework under the Papua New Guinea Constitution than we do in New South, than we do in Australia. I mean, that should surely be a lesson to us, shouldn't it? Um, but instead, you know, what the political elite in New South Wales are deeply opposed to a Bill of Rights. And really, Bob Carr was one of the people who stood up and said a Bill of Rights is deeply dangerous because it's going to limit what politicians can do. You know, you don't want judges giving people rights. Parliaments should be able to do whatever the bloody hell they like and the courts and people and basic rights should just get out of the way. And I've got to say, that's the mindset when you're in Parliament. I think Maureen would probably agree with me. They will ram anything through, anything at all through. And in fact, next week, when Maureen and I go back to the New South Wales Parliament, they're going to be putting in a set of laws that try and will be trying to put people into jail for future crime, crime they may commit in the future, and a set of laws designed to make orders against people on the basis of secret evidence in secret hearings that you never see, that will be prohibiting what you can do, who you can talk to, where you can go, on the basis that you may commit a crime or you may be involved in a crime in the future. You never see the evidence, and then if you breach the order, bang, you can go to jail for five years. That's what Maureen and I are going to be dealing with next week in the New South Wales Parliament. Do we need a Bill of Rights? Absolutely we need a Bill of Rights. <clears throat> Um, you've, you've got to love the idea of thought crimes um, being legislated about. Um, the, 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 I was going to pick up on the point that you, know, you look at the cast of characters in the New South Wales um, hierarchy and how whilst we have Troy Grant very conservative, we've also got Mike Baird who's made it a priority to fund and establish a whole bunch of clinical trials that will involve adults who also happen to drive being prescribed THC-based medicines that the government-funded studies are actually going to be making criminals of the patients being treated in those very studies. Yeah. Uh, there's an iron... It was not just... It's actually a... a Incoherence. A, it's an incoherent policy. Yeah. Well, welcome to drug law. You know, as Fiona said earlier, it's all based upon some incoherent moral prejudices as opposed to any kind of rational construct. And um, yeah, and we've asked them flat out, are you going to be making allowances with drug driving programs, with the drug driving test for people on medicinal cannabis? And the answer is no. You can get your medicinal cannabis, but you can't drive to the doctor to get your medicinal cannabis. You can't drive to get any treatment once you're taking medicinal cannabis. I mean, that's just incoherent is a polite description of it. I think it's me. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thanks, David. I think that you have uh, framed this issue so brilliantly. It was an issue that many people within the movement were putting in the too hard basket because of the real concerns about impaired driving. And I think that you've done a really good job of finding that point of really taking it to task while also putting the, you know, the issues that people care about at the forefront. So I wanted yeah. to start with that. I've got a question. Just a, um, a really technical question. I'm assuming that the UK testing regime tests for a metabolite of THC. And I'm going to follow that question with a comment which relates to some of the other questions that came up before, especially about the thing about swilling a mouth out. I think that guy's gone. But my understanding, and I got this initially from the National Cannabis Prevention and Information Centre, a centre that is no doubt very close to all our hearts, the scientific con consensus is that the presence of THC in oral fluid reflects debris in the oral cavity. For example, you smoke a joint 
there are tiny particles that contain THC that remain attached to your gums and teeth. That's what is um, providing the positive in the test. And so, you know, one of the things that we need to be careful about is protecting people who are part of our movement without endorsing impaired driving. Impaired driving. This, the, the scientific consensus would suggest that brushing your teeth or these things about mouthwashes, you know, there is some basis to that, but I don't think it's got anything to do with the, the particular herbal extract. It's simply about the process of swilling A good mouth thorough out. clean. Brush yeah. your teeth. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, well, I'll take that largely as a comment. Look, the UK model, the U and, it's, and, and Will's been doing great work and Anaham are doing great work too, and I, hats off to them for trying to get the message out more broadly, Will. Um, but the, um, the UK model is not perfect. It set the impairment level for cannabis below what was recommended by the independent expert panel. So it's testing for a lower threshold for cannabis than was recommended by the independent expert panel, largely because politics got in the way of it and a bunch of people in the UK Parliament said, we've got to be tough on cannabis. Um, and they also set the level for benzodiazepines, um, prescription uh, Valium and the like, at an ex extraordinarily high level. Because again, they didn't want to find themselves in trouble with middle class UK and getting people who have been prescribed on high levels of benzodiazepines. So the UK model is, a, is the best international working model that we can point to, but it's actually not perfect. Uh, hi. I think it's me. Yep. Um, I'd like to take up that point on irrational constructs. I love it. I've been thinking about one in this area this week, and I know you're a um, New South Wales parliamentarian, not a local politician, but for me this is just the great, you know, irrational construct, is that this council has this event up in their literature and sells it as a, you know, cultural tourism event, uh, in this area and supports it, and yet we have this stuff with the police. Yeah. It's just absolutely irrational. Well, I actually went, you know, I'm, I'm the justice spokesman for the Greens, so, you know, when I turn up in a town, there's a bunch of people on my calling list and one of them tends to be the local police. So I went down and had a chat with the inspector this morning um, when I got here. Um, and, um, you know, the police, their official line is they're going to be enforcing the law. And, you know... It's easy to get angry with individual police when they're enforcing a particularly stupid law, but it's not their choice. They're being given a bunch of dumb laws by politicians. And in large part, local police here are, are doing this because they're told to, not because they've bought onto the program. But, um, but the... Um, um, so, look, you know, police are public servants. My view is try and respect the police as best you can in your interactions with them. But there are police in the police... There are members of the police hierarchy, and I'd single out Commissioner Scipioni who actually has a very aggressive approach to this. He's asked for the resources, he's got the resources, he's directing our scarce tax dollars to this program and police time to this program. And so there are people at fault, I think, in the high levels, the hierarchy of the police, misapplying their resources because of their particular moral agenda. Sorry, yep. Sorry, it's more my... I wasn't having a go at the police, and I know they're doing a job. My question was more I wanted to be framed around that strangeness that, that oh, yeah. this council... This, yep. this council's good, got a great mayor, and, as I say, advertises this as a cultural tourism product yep. as part of their product mix in their tourism agenda. Could... No, I get is there point. anything yep. that, that the local government, the local police can do about this, or are they completely... Nothing. The, the, well, the police do their it, police thing, like, you know, the politicians do their okay. local thing and that's... Here's yeah. an idea for you. We've got local council elections happening in September. You've got a pretty good council, you've got a pretty good community. Why don't you petition your local council to do a referendum on legalising cannabis to be held in conjunction with the September local government elections and see what your local community says about it? It would be really powerful. Um, uh, yeah, but it's incoherent. We've got... Sensible local government, stupid state government, and they're at loggerheads, literally surrounding. While we're trying to promote people to come to Nimbin and for Mardi Gras, one level of government, the other, other level of government surrounds it like we're, like we're under siege by the New South Wales Police, and it's dumb. Um, David, we're just going to have three more questions and then wrap it up. Okay. Um, and I guess if people want to keep chatting to you, they can do that after we finish. So go we've got Greg, a gentleman over here, and there's a lady just here wants to speak as well. So over here. 
Uh, thanks, Dave, for a massively informative uh, talk. Look, I just have a practical question uh, on, on your defence uh, for driving under the influence of cannabis. Essentially, you seem to be saying that if you fess up to having smoked cannabis or consumed cannabis uh, 48 hours prior, you are getting a defence to the charge of driving under the influence, but no doubt confessing to an offence itself. Is that uh, a practical issue or is that uh, not so much in this day and age? First up, I'm not giving anyone legal advice. Yeah. So I'm telling you what the courts are doing. I'm telling you what um, Justice Helpin found. Justice Helpin found in that case, and that's all I'm telling you about, in that case, that Joseph Carroll's argument that he'd been told by the police that he had to wait seven days and he'd waited well beyond seven days and was still found guilty of an offence and was still, was still failed the test, that in that case he made, he made out the argument for reasonable and genuine mistake of fact. Now, that's because he came in front of a magistrate who has his head screwed on and is a decent kind of guy. You'll probably find other magistrates who'll just say, I don't, I don't believe you, um, and, and, and will take your licence off you regardless. Um, all I'm saying is that... The line of authority that, that Helpin relied upon is good authority. The police have realised that the defence is open and I'd suggest people get educated about what the New South Wales government is telling them about drug taking and about how long you have to wait typically. Get yourself informed by that before you get behind the wheel of a vehicle so that if you do find yourself on the wrong end of the dro roadside drug testing laws, you can tell your lawyer what you looked at, you can tell your lawyer what you relied upon and you may be able to get that defence up um, subject to legal advice. But okay. yeah, So I'm not giving, not telling Absolutely. anyone there's a get out of jail free card, I'm not telling anyone they're going to guarantee to get a defence up, I'm telling you Mr Carroll got his defence up. And in fact, three or four others have got the same defence up. Just to clarify and following yep. up, yeah, quite clearly you would say nothing at the uh, roadside testing station about prior consumption, but you'd keep your powder dry, possibly for a court case that would give you a defence. And at that point, of course, the... Uh, uh, Fessing up to past use uh, may not be reacted to by the police. So yeah. it's, of yeah. course, I mean, we would know this. The offence is not consuming drugs. The offence is having drugs in your possession. Um, so um, that's essentially... Administering drugs. Administering drugs, yes. But having drugs in your system is not an, is not an offence of it, itself. But it is an offence now, isn't it, if you're driving a vehicle? Uh, yeah, well, and that, that's what they've expanded it to. Just having drugs in your system, one of three drugs in your system while you're driving the vehicle is an offence, but if you're walking down the road, you wouldn't be the subject of an offence. Um, hi, David. I just want to comment on um, a paper that was done up for the federal government in the mid-1990s by the Australian Institute of Criminology. It was actually commissioned by the federal government. It was quite an extensive... Um, review of cannabis law reform. Now, we're, this is 1990, so what, 20 odd years ago? And I'm just wondering why there's all these continual inquiries and then we have a committee and then we have another one that we, we're all paying for this. Um, when in the 1990s there was this extensive mm. report done, it looked at all the models of cannabis laws around Australia. It looked at overseas models because in Australia we obviously have South Australia has a little bit different and ACT is a bit different. It looked at all of that and the overwhelming conclusion was that the prohibition of cannabis causes more harm to society on every level that they looked at than actual cannabis use. Now that's 20 odd mm -hmm. years ago. Why are we still here fighting governments, fighting with petitions, fighting with the police, I mean, we shouldn't fight with the police, but, you know, it seems to be getting worse, and that's 20 years ago, they said, more yeah. harm from prohibition. Why are we still fighting? Well, I'm only allowed to talk on roadside drug testing now, so, <laughs> no, <laughs> why are we doing it? Oh, because we've been, you've, I think we've been betrayed by particularly cowardish, cow, cow, by cowardice amongst the political class. They're cowed by the Daily Telegraph in, in this state, they're cowed by talkback radio, and they think if they do anything at all courageous when it comes to drug law reform, that people will turn on them. Um, and it's pathetic. I've got to say, it's really pathetic. I've, got to, I've been very surprised, in fact. As Will said, I think many of us thought that talking about roadside drug testing, and in fact talking about drug dog programs, traditionally, if we'd done this in, in, in the New South Wales political environment, we would have expected a lot of hate. A lot of hate from talkback radio, a lot of hate from the Daily Telegraph, a really concerted campaign against the Greens. And in fact, Richard Di Natale, when he, when he, just earlier this year, when he had a, um, uh, a federal summit on drugs, 
um, got a little bit of that. He got, he got a Photoshop picture of him and our other Green Senator from Queensland on the front of the Courier-Mail with a Photoshopped ice pipe in his hand saying, Greens want to give kids, want to give kids ice. You know? But apart from that, and, and Richard dealt with that, I've got to say, with extreme um, uh, professionalism and competence, and he basically used it to benefit and to run and to, and to have more people talk about drug law reform. It actually ended up backfiring on the Courier-Mail. But in, in New South Wales, we just haven't had any of that. I mean, we've had the odd, you know, I, I'll go on talkback radio and I'll have the odd person call up and say, Greens are just about drugs, that's all they care about. But most people are actually saying, actually, do you know, I've, I've heard you, that's right. Why are we doing this? It's stupid. And if we had politicians with a little bit of gumption, we'd already be legalising it. I mean, our position is clear, as Maureen said earlier. On the New South Wales Greens, we say, when it comes to cannabis, legalise it, regulate it and tax it and we'll all be much happier. Oh, no. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> Someone was just chatting to me. I think that's the end, is it? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, David Shoebridge. That's extraordinarily <laughs> educational and important. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Yep. Thanks